If you have any concerns with your privacy, please chat privately with presenters in the chat box, as any chats in the chat box not privately sent will be public and recorded. If you cannot hear the presenter speaking, if you are having any difficulties, please direct them to Rachel Gibson, and you can email me at rgibson at nnedv.org. Ashley will now put my email address in the chat box for you to have, should you have any questions. If you have any questions related to the presentation, please note that we will get to those at the end of this webinar. Please enter any questions you may have in the chat box. The chat box is the best way to communicate with me or my colleagues who are providing technical support as well as presentation material. Mm -hmm. Again, this webinar is being recorded. And after the webinar, a link to the recording and any material shared will be made available in the coming days. We thank you all for your tireless work you are doing to help survivors during this pandemic. I will now turn it over to our presenters to introduce themselves and begin the webinar. I will now project the PowerPoint. Oh, well, good evening, good uh, good afternoon, and good morning to everyone. Um, welcome to the webinar. Thank you very much, Rachel, and thank you uh, to NNEDV uh, for hosting this webinar. Uh, my name is Anthony Carlisle. I'm the Supervisor for International Affairs at the Garden of Hope. And I'm here with uh, my CEO, uh, Ms. Ji Hui Rong, who is also the, the Chair of the Global Network of Women's Shelters, as well as my colleagues from uh, the Mustard Seed Mission Foundation including uh, Daisy Su, who's the director of the Agape Children's Home, uh, Benson Wu, who's out of shot, but he's sitting over there. Uh, he's the leader of community development, and uh, Nishin, who will be uh, doing the presentation in English. Uh, so we will have uh, two presentations from Taiwan, uh, the first one from uh, the Mustard Seed Mission, and then um, a brief presentation from uh, the Garden of Hope. And we'll be talking about the strategies uh, we use to protect uh, people in the shelters, including the staff, uh, during the coronavirus infection. Uh, and Taiwan has been uh, less affected by uh, the, the outbreak than other countries in the world, despite our proximity to China. Um, and this has been attributed to uh, the experience we, we gathered dealing with the SARS crisis 16 years ago, uh, as well as the quick reaction by the Taiwanese government and the uh, Taiwanese people. But um, we, we don't have any, any secrets or any, any magic cures for this, and we're still, we're still um, working very hard to, to try and keep the situation under control. But we're very happy to share what experience we have with everyone and also to hear what everyone else is uh, doing in their regions of the world. So I'm very much looking forward to hearing from other regions too. But before we begin, I'd like to ask uh, my CEO and uh, the chair of the the Global Network of Women's Shelters, you were on to say a few words as well. Jean. Yeah, thank you everyone. You can join the, this uh, webinar to talk about the uh, uh, coronavirus. And uh, we think about uh, our shelters face this problem, but we work very hard so we can share each other, encourage each other. So thank you very much. Thank you. Hmm. Okay, uh, Cindy, would you like to say a few words? We have Cindy Southworth, who's the um, the, the Vice uh, Deputy Director of uh, NNEDB. Thanks, Anthony and G. I am just so honored to be here with all of you today. We hope to be hosting a webinar like this maybe once a week during the worst of the pandemic so that our shelter movements can share what is working and how we are coping and serving victims of domestic and sexual violence around the globe during this time. We will try to pick different times of the day to be more friendly to Oceana and uh, to California and different parts of the world that some of some people are sleeping right now. So we're recording this and we'll have it posted shortly. Welcome everyone. Thank you very much. Okay, without further ado, so we can have maximum time for discussion, I'll hand uh, over to Nishin, who's going to present uh, what the Mustard Seed Mission are doing in their shelter uh, to uh, 
to uh, respond to the coronavirus situation. So the PowerPoint is from their screen? Yes. Okay. Yes. Right. So Rachel will operate the PowerPoint. Okay. So uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. And uh, um, we are the Mustard Seed Mission in Taiwan, and uh, I'm presenting, uh, our representative is David, uh, Daisy and Benson, and uh, I'm just uh, um, presenting on behalf of them. And today the tour bus, tour, tour bus is unfortunately, he can't, he can't make it, so, uh, so he's not, not here. Okay, the next one. Uh, this is the content we are going to we are going to uh, share with everybody today. So, okay, next one, please. Um, this is our our uh, the co our COVID nineteen uh, confirmed cases stati stat statistics in Taiwan today. So we have now in total you can see. 235 confirmed cases today and uh, uh, among them uh, 197 is imported from from overseas and 38 is local transmissions and uh, one, 133 are female and 102 people are, are male and you can see the breakdown the uh, the numbers of each county and city and uh, it obviously the most number is in our capital in Taipei City and the second one, yeah, the second one is New Taipei City, where we are located now, and we'll talk about it later. And you can see that the more that the rural count, rural counties and cities, they some are zero, so are not listed on on the table. And uh, okay, the next one, please. Right. Um, uh, I'm not. I'm. I'm translating here, so I'm not doing the operation. So please bear bear with me. If not, I'm not very familiar with all the details, then I need to consult with my with my colleagues. And this is uh, the mustard seed missions response structure. We we designed it some time before, and it is um it is uh, when every time it is basically for the purpose of natural disaster for like earthquakes or or there's a tsunami for example and of course so this time and the pandemic times we we use the same structure and you can see you can see um we have our general director who is the ceo here as the top and so she will be um, guiding every operations. So this structure is all, all, only here when there's a uh, there's a, a urgent disaster or the pandemic times right now. So under the general director, we have um, emergency response, and the second one is security. So there are two people. There are two uh, directors there. So that's the most. Uh, most important part for the emergency response, uh, Mr. Torbos, he would be he would be in charge of planning, like the um, how to respond and uh, and also the community operations and also the um, the logis the logistics inside the the office and also the uh, communications. The communications part is to in charge of uh, the external communications for example to our donors and um, etc <clears throat> and uh, um i think i have to uh, let you guys have an idea the mustard seed mission we we have community service and shelters so this structure is based on if there is a natural disaster then how should we work with our partners the local churches and the community and the short shelters all together, and our staff and of staff and office and, and branches all around Taiwan. Okay, next one. <clears throat> okay, so let me have a brief introduction to to uh, MSM's children's and youth shelter homes. The mustard seed mission. We have four. We have four shelters. Uh, which is Agape Children's Home, the Mustard Seed Youth Home, Pei Xin Home, and Aero, Aero Support Program. And uh, um, the biggest one are the Agape Children's Home and the Mustard Seed Youth Home. And you can see in the, in the table, 
in the Agape Children's Home, we have 26 residents, while in the Youth Home, we have 20, 20, 21. And um, if we include the staff altogether, then they have total 47 people and 36 people for each. And um, the location, uh, one is in New Taipei City, and then the second one is in Hualien. And you can see in New Taipei City where uh, they have uh, 55 local confirmed cases today. So this is what we need to uh, pay attention to because which means it will, um, it will be related to our response and action we, we take. And uh, uh, the one in the Hualien, because Hualien doesn't have any cases yet, so they will be relatively, relatively safe. <clears throat> um, and in each shelters, we have the staff includes director and administrators, for example, cooks and logistics and social workers and carers. Okay, next one, please. Next, next page. Um, we we put the our prevention measure into six stage from from the mildest and the to the most severe. So you can see the first level is when the central government they announce there's a possibility of community transmission, and the second level is the when there are confirmed cases in the city or county where our shelter home is located or where our employees, they, uh, they reside. And the third level is um, uh, more severe. So which is uh, there are confirmed cases in the township or district of our sheltered home or where our employees, they reside. And the fourth level is there are cases in schools where our children they attend at daytime or or there are com confirmed cases at the in the same building where our staff their home is and the fifth level is there are confirmed cases inside our shelter so in this case the the government based on the government regulations a 14 day quarantine will begin and the sixth level is uh, after uh, the quarantine will be lifted when the after the 14 days have passed and there are, uh, there are no more confirmed case inside the shelter. So based on these six stage, we go to our our next uh, table. You can see how our operations framework. Uh, so next page, please. Okay, I'll just uh, keep it, keep, let me just keep it, keep it short. So we have, uh, you can see in, uh, we put the outbreak level into six levels as what I mentioned. And so in each, uh, during each level of time, we have a different stockpile inventory. So we, uh, we have the counting of how many masks, how many alcohols we have. And we list down the numbers of the uh, number of people of each organization. And uh, we count the, how many rooms we have. So, and also at each level, uh, different roles of staff have different, um, different, um, different job to do. So you can look at to the right, our, in the directors and administrators, they are all, they are all, uh, they all have their different different mission and different role to take in charge of. Okay, so uh, please go to the uh, next, next page, E. <clears throat> this is the actions we already took by date in the Mustard Seed Mission Shelter. So uh, in January 21st, the Taiwan's first case was confirmed. And uh, January, January 23rd, you can, you can take a look at the, the contents on the PowerPoint. Um, I'm, I, I'm, I don't have time to go through all that. And so, but between 23rd and 29th, there's a long six-day lunar new, lunar new Year holiday. 
So that is when the time the children they all stay in our shelter for six days. So that is the that is uh, the our response is is listed on the PowerPoint. And January thirtieth is the first first day after the holiday finish. So we have the we we have seven points of response. It's um it's because we start to have after that day we'll have uh, visitors from outside. So we have we have our our seven guidelines and okay the next page <clears throat> and from february february 1st we also have uh, the kids starting start start school so there are different uh, uh, operations started and uh, all, and after february 18 um we also have more detailed guidelines and uh uh, you can have have if you have more questions you can we can go to more details <clears throat> and next page and after March uh, the um, we have uh, other other guidelines like the visitors they all visitors must wear masks and all the volunteering inside the shelters they are suspended and um, we also have the meals, the meal sitting plan. Now the, the, the children, they are not going to the dining hall to eat together. Uh, we, we deliver the meal to their rooms and everybody must sit at the same seat. They cannot change their seat, for example. And, uh, um, and the last one would be, we also, um, we need to we also identify our nearby medical resources according to mild medium and severe symptoms they all go, go to different hospitals and so we need to identify and list them list them down and uh, we also need to the last one is uh, in case of home isolation and quarantine we need to know how much human resource we have okay next page the next page is our guidelines and operations if the, we really need to do home quarantine inside the shelter. So for example, uh, all staff and children, they will need to live in, live in single rooms. So we need to have enough room. If we don't have enough rooms, you can see we, can, we need to purchase tents or partitions or we need to collect them from, from, from donations. And we also we are also sleeping bags for um, prepare for in case they're needed quarantine and we also need separate showering space separate laundry space and we need to have a waste collection plan and uh, we also replace all the ceramic dishes with disposables and uh, we also sterilize all facilities every four hours and uh, we also have we are also storing food and daily essentials enough for two weeks actually it's more than two weeks but minimum is two weeks <clears throat> okay so that is our brief uh brief presentation so if anybody have any questions we can go into more detail later thanks thank you very much thank you very much Nishin, and to the the team at the master team uh, mission for uh, very comprehensive uh, outline of their procedures. Um, so, uh, Rachel, is, is there anything you need to bring to our attention or any questions that we can answer right now, or shall we wait until uh, after my presentation? Yeah, we did get one question. Um, let me pull it up. And I think it's specifically for you all. Uh, someone asked, what happened to the financial resources of the shelter? Did they completely stop or did the government help mm -hmm. or take part? I, I think someone, uh, Rachel, I think someone also asked about whether children were separated from families as well. I think I saw that question pop up. Yeah, that might have been in the chat box, though. So we're trying to manage both. So, um, yeah, if you want to answer both of those questions now, you can, or we can hold some of those to the uh, end. Okay. Let's, well, because they'll need to do some translation. So, so there were two questions there. Do you want to answer them now? Or okay. Um, the for the financial part, um, the government, they support with the, uh, the, the disease prevention um, facilities and, and things. And uh, 
钱要交我收入，收入目前收入会收入吗？因为那个木头，那下面我去去找。And our our donors, some are more more or less affected. So so the, our financial uh, income from donors would be more or less affected. And uh, yeah. What is the thing? Yeah, the question the questions are flying in now. So I suggest that um, I I make my presentation and then perhaps Rachel, you can summarize some of the questions yes. and uh, put them together so we, we, we don't have lots of repeat questions. Yes. But thank and, you very much for all the and, questions. Yep, well. and it's also important to note too that if we, um, because we have a very limited amount of time and so many helpful questions, we can also compile the questions in the chat box and have them sent yep. to presenters and we can have follow up that way. But I just want to be mindful of the time so that all all the everyone can get the helpful information they can okay all right so i'll go to my presentation then and then we'll come to the questions uh, uh later or we can answer them individually as well so uh, rachel could you pull up my presentation from the garden yep, i am pulling it up now get thank you very much and anthony this is cindy because i can see which of our panelists were able to get in and which ones were not when we move to the gnws board members i'm happy to queue them up and tell them when it's their turn Sure, okay, I'll hand over to you then. Okay, so um, this is a presentation. It's going to be um, quite similar uh, to the Mustard Seed Missions um, presentation, but this is what the Garden of Hope has done and is doing uh, to prepare uh, for the COVID uh, coronavirus crisis at our shelter um, in Taipei City. Next slide, please. So in this presentation, I'll be going through our prevention mechanism, including infection prevention training, employee resident uh, vis and visitor management, and the response uh, mechanism, including in the quarantine zone, uh, handling of suspected cases, and division of responsibilities within the shelter. Next one. So to go on, to start with uh, the infection prevention training, uh, for the training, we have a briefing on the latest information about the outbreak situation. Um, we teach uh, the residents and staff about uh, respiratory hygiene and cough etiquette, um, how to wear a mask and so on, and uh, also how to prepare and clean the shelter with a uh, bleach water solution. We recommend 500 parts per million, which is a 0.5%, 0.05%, uh, um, sorry. Uh, other, other, um, other places I've seen 0.1%, um, but it's, it's about that concentration. Next slide, please. So this is the procedure for employees and residents. Um, basically, everyone follows the same procedure of adhering to uh, food sanitary preparation. So employees with uh, um, fever or, um, or cough um, don't, do not come to work. Um, everyone's temperature is recorded in the morning and the afternoon, and uh, they keep a re record of any um, upper respiratory um, infection symptoms or any other uh, abnormalities um, and there's the usual procedures of washing the hands, recording temperature, uh, residents are asked to shower before dining and wear masks while serving food as well as sitting at least one meter apart. Yeah, and a question about these uh, materials, they're all on our website on um, shelterasia.net so you can look them up there. Um, regarding visitor management, um, we take the temperatures of the visitors when they come to the shelter, make sure they wash their hands, and we ask them questions about TOCC. T, uh, T is for, for travel, so where they've been uh, recently, uh, whether they've been overseas, their occupation, whether they're in a, at a high-risk job, any contact with uh, people who might be infected, or have they been exposed to any clusters of infection, where there's a group of people who've been affected around them. And then... Um, any suspected infections will not be asked, will not be permitted to enter uh, the, the shelter, and only those who meet the conditions will be allowed to enter. Regarding our, the next slide, regarding our quarantine zone in the shelter, we're lucky at this particular shelter to have a whole floor, which we can set aside uh, for a quarantine space. Uh, so that's what we've done. And uh, employees who enter this uh, building will have to wear sanitary uh, protected garments uh, while serving uh, the residents. Um, a note, uh, these are not currently not provided by the government, so we have to pay for these Hamzat suits 
<laughs> and drugs by ourselves. But the government does provide um, alcohol spray and masks to the shelters. And, and also, um, sorry about that. And also they, they provide um, thermometers as well. Next slide. So we follow the following procedures for medical care. So anyone who enters uh, the shelter, is, like I said, has their temperature taken. If they have any um, suspected symptoms, then um, we take them to uh, the nearby clinic uh, for a test. And when the, the test is uh, returned, if it's okay, and they're just found to have a flu or another uh, common cold, then they're allowed into the shelter. But those who are confirmed to have COVID-19 will be transferred uh, to the nearest uh, city hospital which has an isolation uh, facility and if they're healthy enough to return to the shelter but be um, quarantined for 14 days then they'll stay on that third floor and uh, if not they'll, they'll be treated at the hospital and Taiwan has uh, an emergency call number it's 1922 next slide please so this is the, 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 the final slide is this is the structure of um, the work division within the shelter. So uh, the shelter is under the Department of Social and Welfare um, of uh, Taipei City Government uh, for the, and, um, and as well as the Child and Youth Welfare and other various other government administrations as well as the, the headquarters of the Garden of Hope where I'm sitting now. And uh, we'll have a, and a staff to evaluate the safety procedures. And then the shelter staff are, are led by the director of the shelter, uh, the deputy, deputy head and the head of coordination of virus control response. And uh, then the other tasks are divided into health evaluation, uh, resource management, logistics support, a planning leader, planning means um, preparing for medical treatment, um, providing other administration and uh, hygiene and education and uh, shelter environment leader finally and that's uh, providing information on the outbreak from the outside and implementing prevention uh, measures within the shelter okay thank you very much so that's what we're doing um, currently uh, at the shelters in taiwan uh, like i said we don't we don't have all the answers um, i'm sure that you know a lot of this stuff already um, but uh, we, we're just happy to to share whatever experience we have uh, with you and we're very much looking forward to hearing from the regions now so uh, Rachel and Sydney I, uh, Cindy I don't know if you want to take over this session now or if, uh, if you have any questions that we can ask or whether we can just go straight to the regions I think if we do the, this is Cindy Southworth from the US National Network to end domestic violence I think if we have each of the uh, panelists speak briefly then open it up for more questions it's possible that some of the other speakers will be covering and answering some of the questions that have been raised thus far um, and just a, a brief note, I'm uh, going to share just a few sentences about Oceania. We wanted to try to give updates from each region of the world, and it is the middle of the night in Australia and New Zealand, but uh, they both let us know that in Australia, communities are doing a lot of preventative measures, uh, local shelters are doing a lot of phone and uh, video counseling with victims and trying to have limited face-to-face -face contact, preparing the shelters for um, you know, potentially weeks of isolation. And in New Zealand, they're doing very similar. The shelters have been preparing and they actually are going into a government ordered um, sort of shutdown of all but non-essential services. Um, I think it's Wednesday today. So we'll have more updates from them on the next uh, GNWS call. So moving on, uh, Marcella from Italy is, has joined us and we would love to hear a bit about what is happening to survivors of domestic and sexual violence in Italy, uh, Marcella Perone. Yes, hello, can you hear me? We can, thank you. Hello to everyone and thank you for this occasion. I will try to be very brief. Uh, unfortunately, Italy is looked up from all over the whole world. We have uh, yesterday's state data, 70,000 affected and already 7,000 death people. So, and this is only in the last uh, months. So we are of course in a very, very emergency situation. We, Italy has 60 million people. The only, let's say, good thing is that there is a very regional it's uh, quite, it's not spread a lot all over Italy, but it's 
in a particular nodal region, but of course uh, we are horrified and by the thought that it might spread all over Italy. That's why our government has started from the 8th of March, so after, let's say, about a week of realizing that it was becoming a problem, we have a complete lockdown, which is to understand uh, in a very, very strict way. That means that most of uh, the people, all people are asked to stay at home and only very specific categories are allowed to even go to work. Smart working has been the rule for everyone when it's possible. And many works are just not uh, on. That means a lot of economical problems and poverty. That's the normal situation. What is still to say about the lockdown is that it's uh, checked by police, army. They're even thinking about using drones, using uh, the check on the phone, on the mobile movements. I'm saying this because it's absolutely necessary, of course, to force people to be really, really careful. On the other hand, uh, we have to consider what this is moving also for a future perspective on democratic rights. I think uh, we can't not consider this other part. I mean, we are absolutely now giving priority, which is necessary to help, but uh, it's not uh, so easy to, to deal with, uh, also from the democratic point of view. That's one thing I have to say. Uh, women, women are, all women are badly affected by all these measures. Women, all women are locked in at home with kids, caring people, uh, economical problems, no work. And so imagine what kind of stress this has for, like I read from a, many uh, feminist articles about this. This is a very gender specific problem. And this virus is really, again, hitting all women in the world very badly in their own strength, force, uh, freedom, and everything which women have been fighting for. And of course, domestic violence. In situations like that, the, we are very, very worried about domestic violence. So what have we done? And when we, I say we, I'm talking about the shelter movements. Uh, we have about, not we have certainly not a similar organization like we have just seen, and we can, or maybe we know from, uh, the USA and some other richer countries in Italy, like in many other European countries, the shelter movements are coming from uh, very, very, uh, from NGOs, from sometimes very little financed uh, NGOs. The shelters are certainly not always so uh, clear and perfect like I have seen now in this uh, exposition. So it is very, very difficult to offer a proper, first of all, emergency response. We, have, we are worried how, that how many, many women are not able to reach shelters, not even to phone, and also to be then hospitalized by them. So the main uh, aim, the shelter movement, which is an autonomous shelter movement, trying to get more and more money from the governments in, let's say, peace times. So now it's even more urgent. The shelter movements have been uh, doing one big thing, which was important for all women, for the survivors, that is uh, great campaigns, public campaigns saying, we are here. We are here, we are still working, and you can reach us. That's the first thing. And we are actually, by these incredible restrictions by the government, we are actually allowed, we are one of the category of workers who are allowed to work. That means that we can go out, reach out. We have several places so we can walk, simply walk from one place to the other, which we wouldn't be allowed. And another thing we have reached in this uh, regulation is that women are allowed, if they are stopped on the street, because you might have to imagine you are constantly checked and stopped and fined up to 3,000 euro. If you, if you are around with no reason. So that we managed to work out that women can, if they are stopped, can say that they are going, they're escaping the domestic violence situation so they are not asked for the name to, to protect their privacy and that they can 
reach the shelter or whatever safe place they want to reach. Another thing which Hi, has Bella. been... Yeah? Sorry, last, this is Rachel. Last, last thing. No, no, no. We just want ah. you to speak a little louder and closer to the mic. People love what you're saying and, and are, are wanting to make sure I'm that they can hear. Uh, have you not heard till now? I, I am able to hear, but a few people have said that um, the sound is a little muffled. So if you could just get a little closer to the, the mic or speak yes. a little bit louder. Thank you. I, is it better now, maybe? Yes. Okay, sorry. I'm very sorry for that. Another important thing, the government, uh, we have uh, managed to alarm government and responsible in the institutions is that since yesterday, they came up with a law, not with a law, but with a rule, which allows, and not only allows, which asks the local municipalities and police to uh, seizure properties, empty properties, empty flats, uh, available places for women because of course if a woman the shelters at the moment are not uh, capable to uh, take up new women because of the risk for the ones in the shelter so we need more places and this since two days ago we have to look how this is going to work but this was a very strong request of the shelter movements to say we need places places for women to be able to escape with their children because situation in this uh, stress and in this terrible uh, difficulties for women and for domestic violence is really, really a big, big problem. So uh, that's what we are doing. Women uh, shelter, women workers, our specialized services are working full time. Even if it's from smart work, they are, as being, as I said, being allowed. They are making. Uh, turns they're trying to be always in the place when it's needed so I would say that we are making an incredible effort but we are paying the consequences of not having ever had a very good policy on supporting women and shelters. Last another thing we are really really fighting for is the that men should be sent away from homes in these situations, we have actually on the paper, we would have good measures to do protecting orders and things, but the magistrates and the services have till now always applied them too little. So now we are really crying out and saying, if, if till now you've never understood how important these instruments are, now it's the time to apply them. Apply them as much as possible because the violent man has to be taken away from home and not all these women, which we can't really have so many spaces for. I would stop here because I mean, I could go on for ages, but I would like, uh, of course, uh, to leave space for questions. And also I can only recommend, as you know, from scientists and from everything, but from our experience, every, Measure, measure, safety measure is absolutely important and necessary. It's really, really serious. This is Cindy. Thank you, Marcella. We uh, intentionally gave you more time because Italy has had such a devastating impact and we wanted to hear a bit more. Uh, all of our other panelists, since we're going to try to cover each region, will be a little briefer and then we will move to the Q&A part where we're answering the questions that people are putting in the chat. And I found out that Margaret, one of our board members from Australia, has joined us. It's quite late her time, so I'm going to have her next so that she can give us just a few words before we uh, move on. Thank you, Margaret. Thanks, Cindy, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to um, to talk. Obviously, it's a very difficult time for everyone across the world, and um, opportunities like this are greatly appreciated. Um, look, I think uh, in Australia, obviously, we're still in the uh, very early stages, I think, of um, not only experiencing um, the pandemic, but also in terms of our response. Um, across the country, uh, we're seeing various stages of lockdown. Um, we have our, our national government, um, you know, sort of resisting calls, I guess, for total lockdown, uh, with uh, some states doing um, 
a uh, various uh, sort of greater intensity of lockdown. The state that I work in, uh, Victoria, um, is certainly moving, I think, towards um, a stage three, which is probably more of a, um, a lockdown situation. In terms of the impact on um, services, uh, just anecdotally from my service, we've moved um, uh, to uh, telephone-based response. We've had to limit face-to-face um, -face contact with clients um, in our service. And of course, this poses many challenges and many risks for supporting uh, victim survivors. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, and what we're seeing at the moment are calls dropping off um, we're not seeing as many women making contact and part of uh, what we're trying to do is link in with some of our other first responders, particularly health services, uh, police, child protection and others around uh, making sure that we can still get support to, uh, to women and children who need it. There are um, a number of um, government uh, emergency financial packages um, announced, which are providing, uh, will provide significant assistance um, to services. Our state government has indicated they won't be holding us um, to account in terms of meeting all of our funded targets and deliverables under our service agreements. Uh, we're being promised uh, money will continue to come in, um, prioritising the safety and wellbeing of our staff and our um, service users is paramount. We're also seeing additional um, crisis responses being implemented through um, additional investment in uh, emergency and crisis housing, emergency relief. We've had government pensions and benefits effectively doubled for the next six months um, to enable uh, community members to respond to the crisis. Um, in terms of uh, our, our sector more broadly, uh, we are trying to grapple with if we move into total lockdown, even though we are defined as an essential service, we are also trying to plan for what happens um, if our local services and shelters are no longer able to provide the responses. Um, that need to be provided and how do we um, ensure safety for women and children. So there's certainly a lot of conversation and planning going on and I think that um, shelters across Australia and services across Australia are working very, very hard, I think, in a very trying uh, situation. And of course, the vast differences in a country like Australia makes um, the challenges of responding uh, not only to a pandemic um, uh, health crisis are uh, difficult, but also around um, essential services to women and children. So, Cindy, I think I'll leave it at that. Um, I'm not sure uh, I could talk further, but I'm conscious of the other participants as well. Thank you, Margaret. I um, want to try to get one person per region and then we will loop back and do some additional uh, people. Uh, Fatima, if you are available to speak about Morocco and the Middle East, it would be great to hear from you. Hi, everybody. Uh, can thank you speak you. up just a little? Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yes, better. Good. So, hi, everybody. As I said, uh, I came late, but I can, I can always say a few words about Morocco and the Middle East. Actually, we were not, um, let's say, prepared for the shutdown, and we were not, uh, I'm speaking as, as shelters, generally, the few ones in Morocco. We were not prepared, and uh, we were faced with the, the situation that we are sort of left uh, uh, to handle and to cope with the situation by ourselves. Uh, it's okay so far. Uh, we we do have, uh, fortunately, we don't have many women in our shelters. But the, 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 the point now is that all courts are closed and there are no services available. I mean, legal services or psychological services available. Uh, we are doing our best and using our personal means to try to address uh, the unexpected issues. Uh, the situation of Corona in Morocco is uh, 
let's say that the government is, has taken tough measures, really tough measures with the army, with the police, and uh, everybody is uh, asked to, to stay home and uh, no one is allowed to go out without uh, an authorization from, from the authorities. Uh, that's, that's fine, yes. But the other point is that we do have some voices, unfortunately, fundamentalists, who are calling for defiance to the authority and calling people to get out and to demonstrate. This happened in, in three cities of Morocco, but it also happened in many other places in Morocco where you have schools, some private schools who are open for people, for students to go there in, uh, as I said, in total defiance of the instructions uh, of the government. And this is putting everybody at risk. Uh, we can, uh, so going back to, to shelters, we, I can say that we don't know how much time this will, will last, but I, I think that all shelters run by NGOs cannot resist more than one, one month. I mean, uh, I mean um, the first necessities and first services uh, available, we, we, I mean, we can, we can provide. I mean food, I mean sanitation uh, uh, means and, and all that stuff. I'm not speaking about psychological or legal or medical help. It's, it's everyone in every shelter is doing its best to keep its doors closed. We are not receiving anyone now because everything, I mean all the institutions are shut down. There is a total shutdown. The police are not working. The courts are not working, so we don't have any more women coming. And what we we noticed from all the the, 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 the comments and our colleagues is that there is a high high rate now. Let's say let's say violence is increasing because of uh, women being kept locked inside doors. Men and uh, the uh, poverty has increased. Uh, to the uh, the toughest situation women are facing now, uh, you know, we know that Moroccan poverty is is very high in Morocco, and uh, you just imagine ten people uh, in one uh, or two rooms spending all days and being deprived from going out. Anyway, we there is a solidarity between between us let's say moral mental psychological between us those who are facing uh, uh, i mean i mean uh, who are working with women victims of violence and children but still we we we, we are still thinking that there is a risk where if this goes beyond one month we don't know what will happen we are trying to to send our messages to authorities, and we hope we really hope that uh, that that things will get into better better and that things will improve. Uh, this is all I can say. But uh, as I said, the fundamental religious fundamentalists are not making it easy for for us. And uh, and when I say us, it means all Moroccans who are trying to abide by the rules and who are trying to keep uh, safe and to, to, to really to follow the instructions and stay home. Because the only way, we, Morocco is not well equipped to face the pandemic and the only way to face it is to stay home and to stay away and to, to keep that social distancing. Everybody thank you, Fatima. Calling. Thank you, Cindy, and thank you to all. Because we want to make sure we have time for Q&A, I want to move on to one of our participants from Africa. I think Maria's sound was already tested and worked, so if you could speak from Ethiopia, but make sure you're close to the microphone. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me now? A little louder, so if you could sort of shout into your, to your microphone, that would be great. Oh, okay. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me now? Yes, that's better. 
Okay. Uh, I can I can just say about the Ethiopian situation. Joy was supposed to say the African, but the Ethiopian. Uh, now we have oh, we have only reported cases of uh, eleven. Uh, all are from overseas, but we don't know what's going to happen after when screening is uh, done. Uh, I don't I don't think that the whole community is aware about it. Maybe they may mix the flu symptoms and the corona symptoms. I don't know what's going to happen. But concerning our safe houses. We have 16 safe houses. We have a network, network of Ethiopian women shelters in which we just uh, work on the same uh, um, strategy. strategy. What we do is we have already shut down our safe houses. No, no more new cases are accepted. And we have a uh, in each safe house, in the 16 safe houses, we have from uh, 550 to 120 women are in each safe house and including the, the children's 20 to 60. And we don't accept new, new, and we all do, we all do. We every day we have a briefing to the staffs and the residents. Uh, already, when the staffs come to the safe houses, do we have to have the staffs? They cannot work from their home. Uh, the house mothers, the nurses are there 24 hours. We have to have somebody over there when the the, the staffs come to the safe house. They have to clean up their hands before entering to the safe house, outside of the safe house. And we have already arranged a room where they could change their clothes, what they have, uh, their clothes. And they, every day, the nurses, especially the nurses, give brief the, even the staffs in the residence about the prevention method. And, you know, before that, we had a sort of a, a, so cholera was suspected, and we have already... Uh, the, the safe house uh, residents are used to cleaning how to clean their, ha their hands and how to keep safe in the, in the safe house. So they are used to it. And now, and we all have already prepared, we have already stored because of in case if conflicts arise, so if there is an instability in the country, we were already prepared to store food items, uh, six months food items we have stored already from three to six months, which will help, it will help us. And we have already stored food items. And every day, uh, everybody, the, the, the residents and the staffs, the temperature is checked up by our staffs. And since we don't have a quarantine zone, we cannot accept new ones, you know. And we have close contacts with hospitals. The, the biggest challenge was having enough san sanitizers. And now we are contacting the government and the Women Affairs is trying to provide us uh, uh, sanitizers to the safe house uh, staffs in the residence too. And we are trying to minimize, you know, to, to minimize what with the contact with everybody. And the office staffs are now working from the office, from their home. And but the safe house staffs are still, some of them, but we have minimized the number, but some of them are still there. And and what we do is we have a very, very close contact with the nearby hospitals. And a team is well organized, team is organized. And the network, the network is daily, they share information. And we have a, uh, we have a, a response strategy. We have uh, on the process of uh, developing a response strategy, but we have already a strategy which we share, all of us, the 16 safe us to share share and in the city you can see volunteers especially the youth volunteers are there everywhere and they support the ones who who are who, are, who have no uh, who cannot afford for soaps and other even food items they go to house to house to serve the the people and that's a very good and our prime minister is every day on the media and the, all the borders, the land borders are closed, and everybody who comes to the to, through the airport is directly. Everybody is taken to a selected hotel, and they just take them a quarantine of 14 days before uh, going to the city or before finding their families. They are, it's uh, they, they stay at the hotel for 14 days, and I think this is uh, briefly in short what's being done. I tried to contact some uh, African countries, but I couldn't get their access, and some couldn't. I know everybody is busy these days, but praying, praying is what we are doing, and you know we are. Oh, okay, okay, that's it. Thank Cindy. you, Maria. Thank you so much for sharing a bit from Ethiopia. We're going to move to Latin America next and hear from Margarita Guillet.
Hello. Can you hear me? Can you be a little louder? Yes. Um, Perfect. Can you hear me there? Hello yes. to everyone. Uh, well, um, I'd like to share uh, some information about how is uh, Latin America in general related to uh, coronavirus. Um, I sent a map um, that we can see in a minute. But meanwhile, the major concern is now with Brazil that has 1,899 um, confirmed cases of people uh, with the illness. We can see here in this map uh, how is the, um, the problem or the situation in the region. The first, um, the concern, is, as I mentioned, is Brazil and then Chile and few other countries. Um, because of the number of people that are positive to coronavirus. Um, can you, yes, as we can see, um, the difference of colors in gray is uh, the kind of countries that have 2K, 200 cases, and then it goes into a range of blue, intensive blue for the countries that has already more than one, 1,800 cases. Um, I will say that, for example, um, Chile has almost 1,000 cases, uh, Colombia 300, Costa Rica 158, Cuba 48, um, Ecuador almost um, 10,000, Panama 400. Mexico 400, Venezuela, which is a main concern for all of us as regarding the political situation they have, is almost 100 cases. Honduras 30, Nicaragua 2, Paraguay 27, Peru almost 400, Puerto Rico 31, Uruguay 162. Guatemala 20, Salvador 5. So um, the responses so far uh, for this pandemic situation is that we are all learning, including our governments. And according to the political tradition they have, the responses are very wide and very different. So there are some governments that lock down the borders, uh, there are, that is the case of Peru, for example. It is the case of Salvador and Guatemala. But other governments are taking decisions that they consider coronavirus as a national threat to security. So the army, the police um, are taking control of the people's movement, and they uh, put uh, already different kind of uh, times and reasons why people can go out or not. Even though that they don't have a uh, much number of cases, for example, Guatemala, as I mentioned, Salvador, that has only five cases, it appears that this is an opportunity for semi-authoritarian regimes or regimes that have been threatened in political uh, problems inside the governments. They are taking this opportunity to reduce uh, citizenship, uh, freedoms, and um, rights. And uh, regarding the inequality we have as society, this is a high, high risk for women because in a crisis, all the time, the first rights that are um, less respected are women's rights. So our main concern now is what's going to happen to women and girls under this um, machism continent, a very violent, with such amazing numbers of femicides, with this um, ultra power of governments and armies that have no gender perspective controlling uh, the streets and going out um, taking all the rules with all that power to control the you know like the movements of women 
So um, shelters in this condition are struggling to survive. As we mentioned before in some other times, um, shelters movement in Latin America are up just because of the conviction of the leaders of NGOs to, to keep working and to provide the services. But now they are struggling very hard and I guess in the next future, this could be, as Fatima mentioned, and Marcella, very difficult for all of them to sustain uh, the moral attitude for the people, uh, especially if, the, if, part, if part of their team get ill or uh, has a, this kind of situation. So we can see that it's um, very possible that a precarization of services arrives soon. Uh, some countries are reducing the number of beds that are available because uh, they are reducing the kind of strategy to, to be accessible for the people because of the intensive new measures we need to adjust in the services. On the other hand, they are learning how to be safe and to follow all the instructions from the government and sanity measures. Also, um, there is an active movement asking for the governments to take measures that have feminist perspective regarding that women will be very affected in their freedoms and because uh, they always, always are in charge of the home care work this will imply lots more uh, work for them. And generally there are more in the non-formal economic um, status. So uh, now in this condition, many of the different kind of economical activities for women that are not formal will be reduced uh, because uh, it's, very, it's very near an economical massive crisis in all the countries. So, um, this is part of the analysis we are trying to, to put on the table as Inter-American Network of Women Shelters and discussing with our national leaders in the different countries, what can we do? So we came up so far to trying to put in place um, different kind of services for remote, um, to be, to be, to remote assistance, for example, phone and using the, the tools of internet to assist uh, women that will be locked or that had already locked down with their abusers at home. So to, we are going to put um, telephone and different kind of uh, strategies in Facebook that people can that women can reach us, those women that have access to internet um, and can access to have a kind of therapy, contention, inter crisis intervention, or different kind of um, services, uh, how to be creative once we are in quarantine. So there is other kind of um, services that shelters are moving um, because of the situation, telephone lines, transports, um, also trying to promote resilience. Although we are not already in Latin America on that because there are very little cases so far and very little cases of people that are no, no one case inside a shelter that has been dead or that has been um, infected. So, um, but it's very possible that we need to promote resilience, um, empowerment, creativity and how to uh, coaching to, to keep our spirit um, up, not only for the women that we are serving, but also for our teams and for ourselves. So uh, to take care of our teams and by ourselves, that would be very important. Um, some of thank the you, are at home. And yes, thank you. And 
that was such an inspiring way to wrap up to talk about how we take care of ourselves and take care of, of survivors. One thing that I want to mention is that while we are doing everything we can to prevent the spread of the virus, we also need to keep caring for and supporting survivors of sexual violence and domestic violence. In the United States, many uh, sexual assault uh, victim advocates are helping uh, women in the hospital by telehealth. They're using the computer screen to be able to talk to survivors and walk them through what's happening. And Erica Olson from the Safety Net Project at the US National Network to End Domestic Violence is going to talk briefly about some of the ways advocates in the United States are, are using technology to make sure we keep serving victims during this very challenging time. Thank you, Cindy, and hi, everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time to share all of this um, information with all of us. I appreciate hearing from everybody. Um, <clears throat> so as Cindy was saying that we are seeing a lot of move to the use of technology, uh, advocates across the country are quickly moving to remote work and trying to identify ways to continue to provide services to survivors. Uh, we are not under a mandated lockdown and it varies across the country what the recommendations and rules are. Uh, so programs are trying to abide by the social distancing recommendations. However, so they are exploring not only how to limit exposure and spread in shelters, but how to be responsive to survivors online uh, or by phone, text and chat. We've seen a significant rise uh, in the interest in use uh, of remote communication tools like video and online chat. And our project has been trying to help programs to address safety and privacy concerns as they quickly move over to these platforms. Uh, we have been creating materials and holding national webinars on digital services, remote work, and communicating with survivors online. Uh, we've also been communicating with many of the tech companies uh, that are being used for these purposes, like the video conferencing platforms, as well as social media companies, because we know survivors may be increasingly turning to those spaces for support and resources. Um, we think that this is a, a point in time uh, where we can try to really advocate for some of those services to be better in, in the ways of, um, in terms of privacy, confidentiality, and accessibility. Um, and we're seeing them be pretty responsive to that, even though they are um, quite inundated themselves right now, they are trying to um, improve their services at the same time. Um, so we're seeing a lot of that happening in terms of how do we keep the services going, how do we be responsive to survivors, even if we can't um, hold non-residential support groups um, where people are in person, how do we move those to online spaces? Um, we also have seen shelters in the U.S. have um, extremely strict confidentiality obligations and, and as many of you know, um, cannot share health information with anyone without the context, uh, without the consent, sorry, of, of survivors. Um, and so questions around navigating that have been coming from, um, from shelters all over the country. Um, they can't take actions that are considered to be specific to healthcare professionals, so they can't take temperatures or anything like that. So they're quickly trying to take as many preventative measures as possible, um, including trying to get survivors out of communal spaces and into individual hotel rooms. We're seeing a, a lot of programs across the country move to that. Um, and we're also seeing a lot of programs asking for help to respond to the needs of survivors who are trying to navigate the legal issues, which a couple people have mentioned as well. Um, that includes like the courts are closing, um, understanding what the status of their protection orders are, um, and even navigating some safety issues because we're seeing across the country um, some releases from jail and prison where offenders are um, being released to minimize spread within those spaces. Um, but the releases are happening so quickly that they um, they often would be no one would be released uh, without a notification to the victim. There's a, a Vine victim information that, um, notification system that um, ensures that survivors with certain protection orders get notified notified if somebody's being released from jail or prison, and those are not happening. So survivors are trying to navigate that, and so those are kind of the primary buckets where we've been hearing from shelters on how like the the points of, of what they're focusing on. Um, and our project specifically has been um, 
uh, focused heavily on the technology and the digital services work. Um, and you can see, Rachel pointed out our digital services toolkit. We are very fortunate that about a year ago, we um, we launched this digital services toolkit. Um, and so it was just a matter of, of really taking that pre-existing content and information and adapting it um, to be a little more direct and specific to what's happening in this public health crisis. Um, so we updated um, some of this and created some very um, specific pieces. Um, and I know a couple other countries have also already adapted that. I've heard from Australia and Canada um, about adapting the our COVID-19 uh, remote remote tech work and our um, digital services pieces. Um, and so please feel free to connect with us if there's anything in this toolkit that could be helpful to you um, as you're seeing shelters also try to move to um, online um, services. Thank you so much, Erica. This is Cindy. We have about 15 minutes left and Rachel is going to do her best to try to summarize some of the questions that came in, but I want to reassure everyone that we are committed to holding these webinars once a week, uh, at least for the next two weeks, since as we know everybody is so hungry to share information um, in the chat box. Please keep sharing uh, updates from your own country in the chat box as long as it's private and safe to do that and uh, ask questions. We will compile all the questions and all the comments and share them with everybody who registered and also push them out through our listservs and our networks. Uh, Rachel, I'm gonna give it to you to if you can summarize some of the questions and any okay. panelist who has an answer uh, will probably only have one or two max answer each question because we wanna get as many questions in as, as possible. Yes, so I think this is a really good one to start off with. Um, for folks who are are um, being asked, we I know we have had several of our tech partners and friends and bystanders, and so uh, thinking through what uh, advice uh, do service providers have for people who are stuck at home with the abuser under lockdown and feel unable to leave? What are some safety planning strategies for them uh, for folks like that? Uh, another uh, question came up. Um, around communities um, who um, maybe have not had a large um, showing of the virus or for communities who may be not on lockdown yet. Um, how do you recommend those people uh, begin to plan and, and move forward? And then is it ethical to enforce self-quarantine for shelter uh, uh, participants um, for the safety of folks there and then thinking through um, how can how can we help others learn um, and prepare during this time so those uh, I think those are two questions so the first question being how do we help folks safety plan and when they can't leave and what are some things that we can give to bystanders people who work in our grocery stores our friends our family around helping survivors who can't leave uh, their homes during the lockdown or shutdown. And then the second question is for communities who maybe haven't had a lockdown or uh, a large, um, who are, are in the preliminary stages of this, how do we help them prepare and be ready to uh, move this forward? So we have many panelists that yep. are on. If they unmute, we'll probably only have maybe one or two per question because we're, we are so short on time. We will be doing this for the next couple of weeks, so we'll hear from more panelists later. Yeah, perhaps I can answer or give one answer anyway to the first question about people who are stuck at home. Uh, with an abuser. Um, in these kind of situations, um, I think the, the, the employer um, has a responsibility to check up on um, a member of staff who's working remotely from home. Um, if they suspect or know that uh, they're being abused at home, then perhaps that telephone call back to the office may be um, the victim's only chance to get in touch with the outside world uh, because they may be monitored or they may be restricted or controlled. Uh, by their abuser. So um, employees need to, to step up or, or colleagues at work need to step up and look out for um, colleagues or staff that they, they know might be in vulnerable situations. 
Rachel, do you want to put a few more questions out and then we can see if panelists want to try to uh, answer any of the questions that you've tried to summarize? Sure. So um, we did receive this question. In the midst of this crisis, people of, uh, are exhibiting racist tendencies towards people um, who they believe are maybe um, a part of this. How do we, how do we help hold accountable those people and how do we support uh, communities during this time who may be feeling this backlash is one. Um, there's been a lot of questions about children and how children interact with their parents um, who may be in shelter, who may, uh, if children are part of a custody agreement, how do the government or courts deal with that visitation and what does that look like? Uh, we've had a couple of questions come in around um, providing food or or masks in shelter what how do we um provide food or masks to people who are not uh housed in shelter and are your shelters requiring uh people to uh staff members to either stay on site uh during the lockdown are our staff members asked to uh to to be able to come and go as they uh so choose and then uh one other question to, to get us started is um do shelters have uh with their own resources uh take care of the cost of uh survivors who may um, be infected with the virus any of the panelists or some of the uh board members who have not spoken yet but have the ability to unmute if you want to answer any of these questions marcella i know you're still out there um but anyone who uh, has answers. Um, Cindy, it's Margaret from Australia. Um, what, what we're starting to see um, in terms of uh, provision of food and other um, services are, are people who are having to self-isolate and are unable to leave the home. And that could, that could involve um, women and children that we're currently working with. Um, uh, our state government is coordinating efforts with um, Food Bank and also the Red Cross uh, to get essential uh, supplies to uh, to women and children or to people uh, in communities, including um, medication. They've uh, also um, ramped up supports around um, telehealth options, which means that people can uh, connect with uh, their medical practitioners uh, via phone um, for medical health checks and other um, support. So there is um, some emerging uh, work and um, I can send uh, some of the links to um, those types of services um, that that might be of use to others particularly in their lobbying and advocacy efforts I also know that some shelters um, are also um, organizing there are lots of uh, local um, arrangements happening but on a on a wide scale um, I'm unclear um, as to what shelters are doing at this stage maybe if I can say something. That would be great. Marcella? Yes. Uh, I would like just, uh, there has been a colleague of mine who has uh, put a link uh, in the chat where you can see a video which uh, the Italian shelters have sent around and published for the women at home. How can you reach them and what messages do you give them? And one thing, uh, the main message is, that we, the shelters, are working. They're there and that they can contact them and that they have to be strategic about choosing, of course, moments which are not dangerous and also be technologically clear that they can uh, cancel every trace of having been in contact with the shelter because it's really dangerous for them at home. Another thing I would suggest uh, to prepare is exactly this. Uh, we were absolutely not prepared in Italy. 
other countries can really prepare and learn. So I would send out messages to women because the women who come to the shelter is not all of a sudden in a violent situation, of course. So women who are somehow already in situations have to get the message that if something, if the virus comes and if it's becoming a real difficult situation, they have to be really aware how to be equipped. Uh, we need a lot of equipment, technological equipment, everything, the shelters, first but also women they have to be able to be and stay connected isolation is the worst we know about this and in this situation the isolation is really increasing and dangerous so that i would really suggest that you think about that how yourself to equip yourself very very well but also send messages to all women that isolation has to be prevented and that they equip themselves and have already strategies to think about how we're getting out of it. And of course, government. Governments have to be really, really pushed. Last thing I can say about custody. This is an incredible big problem because women have custody reglementations, which of course did not foresee this situation. And now they are put under an incredible stress and that violence and danger by fathers asking for their rights. So this is again, if you are as lawyers, as shelters, helping women to do a good custody reglementation, you can foresee now situations like that and you have to already write in the custody reglementation what is going to happen if, because we are going to have, we are having big problems now because our uh, decisions are, were not of course measured on this, and, men, and fathers are really abusing of these reglementations. So Cindy, we have five minutes left if there's other presenters that want to weigh in. Yeah, Cindy, we have Margarita next in the queue. Thing. Yeah, um, I just like to mention that in the case of the people that are in worse condition in our different countries are uh, those that um, is socially are seen as not equals. For example, immigrant people or people that usually serve others. So one of the way we are trying to do, and I think in many countries do the same, in solidarity with all of them, is trying to keep the jobs of these people. Uh, if they are helping, if they are maids, uh, cleaners, just to support them uh, the more we can, because they uh, earn, the same day what they are going to to pay you know to live so that is important to support each other the more we can and um, to not panic i would say and as we got information from those countries that are with a crisis of immigration we know that now immigrants are in panicking i mean they are uh, suffering lots because the, uh, the the borders have been locked so they are like stuck in detention centers that are illegally i mean um, internationally is uh, international right is not agreed to have detention centers but they are there um, and they are locked there uh, don't have the enough resources and there's enough space to face this pandemic so that is a very critical humanitarian situation for all of those people uh, also uh, regarding the sexual violences and the family violences under this situation um, the other thing I'd like to mention is that to know and to learn the more we can to update our knowledge about how this virus works and infect people is, is uh, very useful in this moment because we don't need to, to wear masks all the time and gloves. If, for example, in our shelters, uh, we don't need it as long as we wash our hands and we understand how we arrive from the exterior and take off our shoes, take off, wash our hands and get into the, the space. And we can have a safe space, clean space with no virus, just with very simple measures of hygiene. 
but we really need to know how this virus conducts and works. So that's my point of view. This is Cindy. I think we will wrap up because we are right at the end of our time. Again, we are committed to creating the space for victim advocates from all over the world to share their success uh, stories, their strategies, their struggles, their resources, their maps, and uh, continue to post in the uh, chat. We will summarize and pull all of that out and send those links to all the participants. And uh, we will probably try to do one in the evening US so that it is uh, daytime for Oceania and um, but we know that will be in the middle of the night for Europe so we will probably alternate between um, eight in the morning Washington DC which was this time and maybe a 7 p.m. evening Washington DC that would allow different parts of the world to participate we will record all of them and post them so that if you miss it because it's in the middle of the night um, I especially want to thank Margarita from Mexico City who joined at 6 a.m. and Margaret uh, from Australia who's talking to us at midnight her time it shows the dedication of people that do this work and support survivors of sexual violence and domestic violence across the globe I also would love to have more speakers focus on how they are supporting sexual assault survivors during this time. So we'll look at that for uh, our next two calls that we'll be setting up. So, um, please stay safe. Keep doing the amazing work you do to support survivors. And I want to thank all of my colleagues on the Global Network of Women's Shelters and especially the Asian Network of Women's Shelters um, and the Garden of Hope Foundation and Mustard Seed Mission who did these lovely PowerPoints prepped. They stayed into the evening their time. It is 9.30 at night for them. Um, that, again, that's their dedication. So thank you, everyone, and stay safe. Thank, and you. thank you very much to all. Go ahead, Marcella. I just wanted to remind everyone that the presentation materials will be compiled and sent out to you all after the webinar. I'm not sure where the posting will be, but you will get that information in the follow-up email um, in the coming days. If you have any other questions, we have provided our contact information, so feel free to reach out to us. Um, and thank you very much for joining. I will now stop the recording of this webinar. Oh, very, Rachel, very quickly. Um, I've posted the presentation materials on the Asia Network of Women's Shelters website, and that's shelterasia.net, and you can find that link uh, on the chat. And I've tried to answer all of the questions um, in writing already, so it will, I guess this chat room will stay open so I can continue answering questions. Yes, and we also want to thank uh, Mary from Rwanda for joining and being a part of this conversation as well. We, we are very grateful to all of our, our participants who are here today, and we thank you, and we will see you all if you to join us at the next one next week. We will send that information out as well. Uh, I will now stop the recording of this webinar.